come to uh, Southern California Software Engineering Symposium. Um, I was tempted to say first Southern California Software Engineering Symposium, but <clears throat> I recently found out that, actually David Redmiles told me that this is not the first uh, Californian Software Engineering Symposium. And you know, so last time I was digging around, it's interesting what you can find on, the, uh, on, on web servers. So actually there is, or there was this thing called California Software Symposium that used to run back in 90s. If I remember correctly, it ran from 1990 to 1998. Um, it wasn't called Southern California Software Engineering Symposium, it was called California Software Symposium. Uh, it was basically a joint effort between um, UCI's IRIS, um, which is the, essentially the software group before ISR. Uh, so I think ISR was formed in 1999, and so IRIS was, a, was an institute uh, before that. So it was a joint effort between IRIS and, and uh, USC Center for Software Engineering. And so this is IRIS's uh, old website you can find on ICS's uh, web servers. Um, I, I was just browsing last night. It was pretty interesting to look at the faculty. And so um, you know, David Redmiles was an assistant professor back then. And you know, most of the software engineering faculty were not around back then. It's kind of cool to look at these things. And I guess IRIS turned into ISR in 1999. Um, this was the symposium in 1997. Uh, <clears throat> So, you know, I can, you can, if you zoom in, you can see some familiar faces or some familiar names here. So, Bill Griswold is here, and he was on the program committee of the symposium. I don't know if he remembers or not. <laughs> um, so, you know, we have uh, Dick Taylor is here. So, he was, uh, he was obviously the director of uh, IRIS back then. And so, this is the, so, the 1997 is when I was a freshman at UCI. I was learning how to program. <laughs> I had no idea all this exciting stuff was happening at UCI in 1998. Um, Dave Rep Miles was the, was the PC co-chair, um, and you know, back then, uh, if you wanted to submit a paper, you actually had to um, print six hard copies of it and mail it to David Rep Miles. <laughs> so some really interesting um, stuff that was happening back then. Um, so, um, <clears throat> you know, this is an event that we've been running for the past 20 years or so as part of ISR. It used to be called ISR Research Forum. Um, this year we uh, changed the scope of it. Uh, we are calling it now Silent California Software Engineering Symposium. We are expanding it to include um, faculty, researchers, students from uh, other um, universities, other uh, organizations in Silent California. Uh, we are hoping this you know, results in more collaborations, more interactions between the academia and industry. Uh, we have an exciting program uh, today. So uh, we have um, two keynotes. We'll start with a keynote by uh, Martin Will um, from SAP. He will uh, look at the synergy of software engineering and AI and you know big data. So that's a pretty hot, um, hot topic. Um, then we'll have um, uh, we have two sessions of faculty presentations. We have seven faculty members from all across uh, Southern California uh, presenting the best and the greatest uh, from their labs. Um, we have an um, open house lunch uh, around noontime. So this is lunch plus poster and demos. So we have students from UCI, but also UCSB, UCR, uh, UC San Diego, and I'm sure there's a bunch of other universities that I'm forgetting that are going to do their posters. Posters are going to be on the fifth floor. So lunch is going to be on the sixth floor. Um, you can grab your lunch and then uh, go to the fifth floor where the posters and demos are going to be. Um, so it would be really, um, I'm, I'm really excited to. to to see um, those demos. Uh, then we have more faculty presentations in the afternoon, um, and then uh, uh, we'll uh, conclude with, uh, with a keynote by Emerson Murphy Hill from uh, Google. He will look at software developer diversity issues, um, which is an important issue in our field. And then um, we have a social hour uh, at the end, uh, where we uh, have a, you know, we'll have some, uh, some food outside in the patio. Hopefully it won't rain, and we get to you know, enjoy the sunny California uh, weather. So I'd like to welcome everybody, uh, you know, those that are especially coming from uh, outside of uh, Irvine area. I know we have a lot of guests from other universities and other organizations in Southern California. I uh, hope, hope the traffic wasn't so bad. Um, and so before we uh, get to the keynote, um, I want to, uh, so we have our Dean, Dean Marios is here. He's going to uh, welcome everyone and say a few words. Oh, you're, you're putting on this <laughs> 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 That was the plan. <laughs> Was this part of the plan, Sam? <laughs> well, you're the dean. You always have something to say. <laughs> oh, yes. that's, a, that's a bad reputation to develop, right? Well, I don't, I, I don't have much to add to, to, to what Sam uh, just, uh, just said. I want to welcome everyone. It's really exciting to see so many, many people coming to this event. 
not just UCI folks, but lots of other colleagues, uh, students from, from other universities, welcome. I think it's going to be an exciting day. Thank you to Sam for putting all this together, and of course, thank you to all the staff of UCI for, for organizing such a great event. I look forward to it. We should get on with the program. Thank you. So my name is Andre Vanderhoek. I'm a member of ISR, also department chair of informatics. Um, and my duty is to introduce, and my pleasure too, by the way, um, is to introduce our keynote. But I have two things to say before that, so you have to just hold on one second. One is, if we go back all the way to Iris and everything else, Dick Taylor is sitting there. Hi, Dick. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Maybe had a big hand in shaping all of this, just maybe so. Um, the second one is I want to just turn to Sam for just a second, because um, I got an email this morning uh, that Sam has been promoted to full professor starting oh, July 1st. Oh. So, <laughs> so congratulations. Um, for, for those who don't know, that's a big deal. So, <laughs> um, Awesome. Um, with that, um, I'd like to welcome Martin Will. Uh, Martin is uh, gracious enough to come join us and talk to us about <coughs> machine learning, software engineering, great big experiments, and a bunch of other things. Uh, Martin has a PhD from ETH Zurich, um, and then rolled into a career with machine learning and stuff, is uh, the, way, the way I would put it. <laughs> <laughs> stuff used to be life sciences, became uh, healthcare stuff at Microsoft, um, stuff with Alexa at Amazon, um, and then for the past few months, um, you've been heading up the SAP uh, Innovation Center here in Newport Beach, which we as a school are super excited that it's here. Um, you've already hired some of our alumni, um, and we're looking forward to building a nice and close ties together. Uh, and with that, Absolutely. that's what you get for building close ties. You get to be the keynote speaker and tell us. Thank you so much. Well, thanks so much for having us here. Um, I'm actually saying us because it's not only me here, it's actually quite a few of my team are almost half the team at least, it's my whole team sitting here. Did you guys want to wave quickly? So this is ICN here yep. in the area. Let me quickly end up my screen here. So, um, yes. Um, Andre had actually framed it quite nicely when he said, it's kind of stuff with big data and AI. And I checked our presentation, so the term big data, artificial intelligence, I think they don't show up anywhere else in the presentation. Which I, th which I think is really good, because um, there's so much to talk about it that um, here what really more focus on, well, um, what's really going more on, on the engineering side. And I also want to talk a little bit more, so I mean, as Andre was, calling out as an introduction, I'm not a software engineer scientist. I'm not a researcher in this space. My background is theoretical <laughs> computer science, and it made my way through the field more as a practitioner year building application. The closest I have to software engineering <coughs> is I have a certificate from UW in software product management, and that's as far as it gets. <laughs> so just to set expectations here. Um, before I start out, uh, let me maybe give you a quick introduction to what ICN really is. So what is the Innovation Center that I'm representing here? Uh, you see this fancy new building also in the picture up here. Um, and so <coughs> as humans, we're actually just a fun group, as I maybe at least half if not the majority of them are actually in the room here now, so meet and mingle later. Um, we're essentially a multifunctional team spanning software engineering, data science, user design and research, product management functions, really um, all the different functions you need to go from an idea through technology to at least conceptualizing and validating a product idea. Um, we're doing this, and that's also why it's <coughs> called a network. It's not, so we are not, this is not the only site we have, it's the latest edition. We have presence in multiple geographies. So um, in the US, we have another site in Palo Alto. Um, we have, of course, sites in our homeland of Germany. Um, so Waldorf is the original um, founding site for SAP. Potsdam is close to Berlin, where a lot of the, the newer technologies came from. Um, <coughs> And then there's a site in, in China, Nanjing. Um, also, one thing that 
because often people, that they approach this, so, so what is ICN as innovation center really doing? And essentially there is a process of how we essentially look at what's out there, what are new trends, what are new technologies coming up, then look, exploring them deeper in if it's the right technology to map into a business case. And then the question is, how does it actually fit into a business case? What really is, is the thing around it that needs to come together in order to turn this into something and productize? So for example, um, recently you may, if you ever followed SAP, because you knew before this presentation what SAP is, um, you may have seen, for example, we've done quite a bit of work in the blockchain. And while you may have seen many other companies either just talk about blockchain or primarily packaging the core services and, and, and infrastructure pieces as we developed all the academic centers, by right? a lot of repackaging of Ethereum. Um, our focus was, for example, uh, building the first case studies and deploying them in industry, right? So, for example, in the US, we have a case study running which is about um, tracking pharmaceuticals along the supply chain, and particularly to address the opioid problem when pharmaceuticals get misbouted accidentally. That's a great application. Or another one is, um, say, you are interested in, in, in farm to table, so another um, deployment of blockchain just as happened was actually now, for example, in, in environment friendly fishing where for tuna fillet that you buy in the supermarket from the participating commercial vendors, right, you can actually scan a barcode and using the ledger, you can actually go back the whole history of how it was processed, transported, to actually even the fishing vessel on which it was called the package originally, right? And again, right, because you're going across so many different parties, the trust element that the blockchain brings really adds something and changes that way. And I think that's kind of the, the, the framing to think about what our um, facility is doing. It's, it's doing these kind of explorations and, and, and experiments. Um, what may also be interesting, that's the last slide I have to that, then I'll switch to the real topic. <laughs> um, um, ICN also has a partnership program, an academic partnership program, um, that has three components. Um, I think the newest addition is that we now have a fellowship program that um, essentially allows uh, a visiting researcher to spend um, an extended period within an SAP product team. Uh, for example, for sabbatical, that may be uh, an opportunity to maybe see what is actually happening out there in the industry and use that as stimulus for research agenda. Um, we obviously have project sponsorships and we have ongoing projects here with UCI and we'll actually talk later this morning about what, what we've accomplished so far together. Um, and then of course, uh, there's always the opportunity of internships um, and uh, Again, we have actually interns at this point in our team. Actually, I'm calling you out. <laughs> <laughs> um, good. So let me start with the real presentation. Um, you've probably seen many versions of the slide, how bad the state is in the software industry. <coughs> I took this one just because it's one of our training material on design thinking. Um, so I think we still see a problem over the industry, right, of how do we ensure that we're actually building the right kind of products? Um, and Tobias actually told me, so Tobias, some of you may know, he has been actually visiting researcher at uh, UCI for some time. He actually told me last night, actually, it's his slide that I stole. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that it's really about finding that sweet spot, right? What's, what's feasible, what's really possible? What can I do with the current technology within my resource constraints? What's desirable for user? What actually um, is desirable, um, is delightful as an experience? And ultimately, it also needs to be commercially viable. I can't just create cool things and they won't sustain in the market environment. Um, and all of you have seen some form of this process. I mean, there's whatever your process methodology framework is, there's some form of determining what is it that's needed, some form of coming up with 
a solution approach, the design part, some way of building it and getting it to the quality they can put in front of a customer without being totally embarrassed, and lastly, think about how I scale it out, not only selling, but through the whole life cycle. Right? And um, I'm acknowledging we've moved on from waterfall. Um, and there are def many, many different forms which have been developed about how to build feedback loops, iteration, incremental approaches to mitigating risks, getting early feedback, etc. Um, what um, I want to also just use for the remainder of this presentation, so here is one version of what SAP is using. So this is one version of the design thinking flow that we have. Um, even within SAP, there are multiple versions of that. But I think for the purpose of this discussion here, that's as good as any of the others. But the phase of discovery, the phase of designing, and the phase of delivering a solution. So let's drill in into the design piece. And obviously, it's not just the stage. Again, we do it in an iterative form, right? We do it in a form where having an understanding of what we want to provide to a user. We look at different options. We develop a prototype. We're testing out this prototype. We're validating the concepts. We iterate until we find this is not something we want to move forward into the next stage of productization. Um, and validation is not the first thing I want to key in on, right? Kind of what what does it now mean to, to, to validate a concept um, once I have a design? And um, you can do it easily in a small scale on maybe even just with a wireframe on paper and providing it with a select form of users. Um, but I think particularly in now uh, the larger tech companies over the last 15 years, right, we really have built this discipline of continuous experimentation, right? And in the strongest form, continuous experimentation means all these decisions that I'm making to build a product, they're completely data-driven, every single one of them. And um, I measure directly the, the impact on the end user before making a decision of bringing that feature forward. Right? And um, it's been written about quite a bit, I think, and definitely all Many, many uh, companies have adopted starting with the <coughs> big players at tech, the Google, the Facebook, the Amazons. But we all see it more broadly in the industry. Um, and in many cases, the core building block is, is this A-B testing piece again, nothing new. Um, where essentially, in the live production system, I have multiple versions of the same capability embedded, and I have the infrastructure, I simply run um, the software in a way that when a user comes in, based on whatever the criteria are, it may be purely random, it may be that I have certain profile information that will route them into um, one of my different treatment groups, right? The baseline, which may be the existing functionality, version A, version B, and I'm just measuring what's happening when they see now this different version of the application. That can be just changes to what is the information th that's being presented. It can be how this information is presented. It can be, here's a completely new user experience. And it's really the question that guides how that is done. Um, so from a process perspective, right, then essentially um, we're embedding this hypothesis-driven experimentation flow into our three stages, right? Going from the building, the measurement, right? The build essentially the design, the prototype measure is the validation piece, and the learning is the feedback loop we had in the previous slide. Um, but I'm not really adding a, comp a full experimentation methodology in there, right? There's experimental design happening, there's the execution experimentation is needed, and there's an analysis piece that I'm embedding in my software development. <coughs> so, um, a 
of course, what's enabling that, first of all, as a director, is that I just have continuous everything. Like it's continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous player. So these are essentially the, the, the foundation I need to have anyway. And I'll, I'll talk later in an example um, that not having to care about these basic engineering practice, uh, practices is actually super important because there's still quite a bit to do on top of that. Um, the other piece is I need to think about what kind of additional infrastructure I actually need to bring into my system, right? And um, so often that, and that's essentially the piece that you never see as an end user, right? That that's actually whenever a system is set up as formed, that's all its infrastructure built up in the, in, in the back end. Um, for example, um, particularly once you go to a systematic usage of continuous experimentation, right, it is the case that you have multiple experiments ongoing, likely even at the same time, and they are also sequenced out over time. Uh, which means you would be probably having to work with hundreds if not thousands of experiments over the course of the life cycle of an application. And you really need a design and experimental design system and backend system to just keep track of all that, right? What are all the variations you run? What are the questions and what <coughs> are the experimental protocols leading up to that? So it's really it's the same thing that you see in, in a life sciences, pharmaceutical development, or right, any other field where you do very experiment-driven uh, development. Um, you need the analytics capabilities, and of course, uh, the most important part is having all the instrumentation in your application, right? Because um, you need to be able to measure the correct outcomes and, and the factors that, that will inform the design decision upstream. In some cases, it's very easy, right? If it's, um, it can be just on my, say, I'm measuring the design of a, of a buy now button and I'm looking at the revenue I'm generating, that's very immediate. Right? It's, I select this, that is my revenue. Um, it becomes much more difficult to see what to measure when the distance between what your business outcome is and where your design element sits is more far apart. Right? And there's also a question, are there intermediate, maybe even artificial measurement points I need to introduce in my application in order to get the right information out of that? Um, so the instrumentation actually is, is also a key, key thing here. And um, what I want to talk a little bit more about now in, in a, an example that uh, we've been doing a year ago is the prototyping piece. So what does it actually mean to, to prototype now a piece into live application? And now the problem is, so a year ago I was still working at Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> and Amazon has very strict uh, non-disclosure Thing. So let me try to explain what we were trying to do so you can follow me. <laughs> <laughs> so the experiment was ultimately a data science experiment related to the shopping results page. And uh, I'm sure pretty much everybody is familiar with this page. You go in at the top, you put in your search terms, it comes up with a list of stuff. Um, and um, all these items ideally are somewhat related to what you put in as a search term. They're featured in a concise form with a picture, some description, some rating, price, and they show up with some order. So the data science problem we were looking into was, um, can we improve the purchasing behavior by not will be extremely vague on purpose adding in some additional data that we had, using that possibly to reorder the items, but also making it clear in the user interface why these items had been reordered. Right. And we had, there had been a, a manual version of that where for 10 products somebody had done this manually, and that had worked really well. And the question was, can we scale this process using machine learning? And what is the impact? And so, What's important now for the rest, for the next two slides is, it's actually a very minor change in terms of customer experience, right? For the customer, it is rearranging the items a little bit, and it's adding two more textual elements to how we present the items. Um, so it's simple, right? Uh, 
Um, so this is kind of what we had to go through. So the first thing is, um, we actually need to work with the web designer to design the final outcome. And the reason is, let me just go back, all these layout questions, the way this is presented, is the result of multi-years of data-driven experimentation. Every single pixel, right? Which means, if you actually add some information in there, it has to look visually pristine, because otherwise, just the difference in, well, this is just a scrappy thing, and the font is a little bit off, it doesn't scale correctly, will throw you off. And we had a machine learning problem. We didn't want to do a visual experimentation. But in order to do the experiment, we actually had to add this information in. Um, that obviously no regressions. Um, production <coughs> plans, the biggest production plan for the stuff on these kind of commercial websites is actually <coughs> no impact on latency. Because again, latency is super important to links directly to, to revenue. A few milliseconds you see it in, in your revenue report. So no impact on latency. Now this is kind of where all the continuous everything comes in, right? Of course, yes, you just run all the tests and make sure this works. Um, we had quite a bit of collectability on the data backend, right? Because it was a small data set, we only were doing it on select products. Um, so we didn't need to really build a full data pipeline. We only had to make sure it's coming out of a data store for the live system that meets all the abilities we need. And a little bit of hand scripting, so um, that's fine. But, um, you run these experiments not on a single day, you run them, say, over months, right? Because you need to cover in enough data points that you get statistical significance. Of course, over that time, what you know about your catalog and inventory changes and also how people perceive what you've been do what you've been selling over that period changes. Which means even though it is semi-manual process to do it, you still have to think about what are actually my refresh intervals for adding, updating my models, so I'm still having equivalent information on the front end. And a big thing here is, um, the last thing you want to have is you run your experiment and the item goes out of inventory. <laughs> right, so we actually need to, to make sure that feedback loop is, is also built into that experiment. And once you all add all that up, that's 2.5 months of engineering work just to run this one experiment. Um, and as I said, that's an environment where all the tooling, all the frameworks are in place, right? I mean, to run my, my experiment, the frameworks, planning infrastructure, the reporting pieces is all there. It's just, just to make my one experiment comparable, still quite a bit of work to do. Um, and um, of course, we could say, well, for the next iteration, we'll just change the algorithm to the back end it's lesser work, and probably the first item goes away. But, and the second one isn't really that simple, but I think even for the simplest form of actually having a way that keeps my data up to date as I'm doing these, these experiments is, is still something that will need to be taken into consideration. Before I go on, um, so they actually came across this, this kind of empirical study. I don't think it was a very foundational study, I think. So it's a, he's out of Switzerland. He's currently preparing his PhD, and he's starting out. And continuous experimentation was just starting out what's actually the state in the industry right now. And he was not looking decidedly, not in the big players, but kind of what's happening in the mid-sized companies. And he surveyed like, I think like 40 to 50 um, engineers across mid-sized companies, still somehow web-based, but not the big web companies where they are. And um, essentially what he said, he said as a findings, first of all, um, there's definitely still a lot of development need in these companies to develop principled approaches to actually how to develop, how to uh, actually embed such an experimentation methodology in my development life cycle. Um, also kind of when I actually do a, when do, for example, even in simplest case, when do I actually decide to move forward with making a product release? even at this very foundational level. Um, and then, of course, many um, systems just don't have the, the architecture that allows you to easily swap in and out uh, functionality. Um, 
And now, for example, being an SAP, which has, on one hand, a very modern product lines, like Conquerors, like a, a web-based service, a software as a service, um, travel and expense system, super easy to do experimentation. At the same time, we have the ERP stack that was developed primarily in the 90s, right? Client-server architecture, and then incrementally moved, decomposed and moved now as a cloud service, um, they also have decomposition as, as one of their challenges um, ahead of them if they want to adopt these technologies, these, these methodologies. And the last one, and we'll get to this later, there's also a change in um, responsibilities and understanding that every single engineer on such a team needs to have. In the sense that um, typical engineering education is very much more focused on the, I would say, the formal method side of things, of really how we go about, yes, learn, learn about what the user wants to do, but then it's more just writing down the requirements and design and the proper way of testing, but approaching it with an experimentation mindset, even right, um, is something um, that needs to be done. So I'll talk about this a bit later. Now, going back to our case, um, as I said, if really all changes that need to go through this cycle, even for resource-rich resource organizations, it's, I think there's still a question, um, how do you actually go about deciding which experiments to run? Because it's, it's expensive. And always having an upstream prioritization of what's the cost value benefit before I do uh, a given experiment. Um, for example, in our case, um, there is actually an internal review process where you go in with a proposal for an experiment and you go in with some data points why you think it's valid to, to explore that question on the live system and what the impact is also in terms of overall experimentation that I'm planning to conduct as an experimentation. But it's still a manual review process. It's, it's really not formalized yet. Um, and then also kind of many guidance that you find will say it should really be one variable at a time, um, but maybe also maybe there's a structured approach to, to bring in multifactorial designs. Again, I've seen more ad hoc stuff in that area. Good. Um, Want to move on to the next little box we have, right? We have um, the discover part. So this is kind of, I understood the problem, I'm just looking to find the best solution to it, and then optimizing that. Uh, let's go up a step. Um, what's, the, what's the data-driven way to find new user requirements? Um, and um, there's obviously a space in, say, the classical web and, and visual user interface, where some form of implementation gave me some insights. I think it's even more interesting when I work in a very open-ended environment, right? I mean, something like a, a voice assistant is kind of ideal, right? So you have this little cylinder in your room, and particularly the first time you present it to a user before they have any connotation, if they can just record whatever the user says, you collecting a log, and, and by the way, for Alexa, it's always a question, what does Alexa record? Um, <coughs> whoever has an Alexa on your app, you can actually go into settings and history, and you see the full log of all the recordings that Alexa ever did. And it has the audio in there, it has a transcript, and if you like, you can provide feedback if that was the right or wrong behavior, and you have a delete button if you want to delete that stuff. So just, this answer, the question comes always on, what, what does Alexa keep? You see it in the app. What you see in the app, that's what Alexa keeps. Plus metadata around the service. But, so you have the service log, right? So it's actually very rich because it's an open interface. So the user is not constrained in what they're saying and what they're trying to accomplish. So you can now attach an um, analysis workflow at the end um, that allows you to discover what's happening. And I think the most interesting discoveries are more of this shape, right? Where you say it's not really um, I like the the users trying to do X and the system just doesn't know how, to, how X works. That's useful, but it's not the most interesting discovery, I think. Because you know I just haven't built that. 
the interesting one is this one, right? When you see, well, <coughs> we analyzed how customers are using a certain feature, and as we are looking at it, kind of clustering what we saw there, the kind of requests that came into that, they actually have been using this feature to do something else, right? And yes, you can accomplish it with the existing feature successfully, that's why we see it repeatedly, <coughs> but we should either modify that, or maybe there's actually a new capability that we can build and provide that is way more effective than what you kind of have built themselves as a workaround. Um, <coughs> and uh, as I said, I mean, in terms of capabilities, you need, you need the log, and you also need to capture all the other metrics and the outcomes, of course. What was successful, what did they actually do? Um, you need a data, data warehouse because it's a lot of information. You need to slice it down based on your question because whenever you come to a question, you narrow it down to a specific subset of, of functionality, a specific functional area, but right? you don't go all the way across. Um, and then probably some kind of capabilities for pattern mining, right? Kind of how do I actually find the right kind of pattern or how do I actually identify interesting patterns um, and what other reports you need to combine to actually find signals that then ultimately need to go to a human for interpretation. Um, that last step is again interesting, right? I mean, A, yes, we have to do it properly, I mean, but when we say it goes to a human, this is where the data privacy flashlight goes on, right? But before we, everything is captured very secure, very encrypted, so what are actually the gates when it's safe to expose it to, to a human person, right? Um, something to think about. Um, I don't say what, but there's a lot of thinking of how actually, what actually are the processes that make sure you <coughs> expose users at that point. When you say, here's a finding, now that a user is a little bit into it. Um, now, Interesting part is so you went through this process, you come up with your new functionality, right? So Alexa blocked the blurb with the foo bar. What does Alexa say? I don't understand your request, right? So the first time this happens as a user, right? I mean you'll probably write a formulae. So you will say something, Alexa, but it'll block the blurb with the foo bar. Right? You frame it and it's still not good. And I think usually people will do one more attempt where they kind of kind of getting a little bit frustrated, right? Blood that will bloop into the foo bar, and the device still doesn't understand. Now what's happening at this point, right? At this point, at this point we train the user that the application doesn't have this feature. Um, and um, that's actually a challenge, right? Because particularly for these very open-minded interfaces, because um, in the classical WIMP, approach, I mean a key change from the old 60s command line driven interfaces into the 70s, what is now commonplace, but right? the graphical interface was the menu that has the possible commands that the application understands. And in the original form, they were also very explicitly arranged, plus applications could, could do that much, so I could arrange all of the commands quite easily at the top or at the side, but it was that direct education of the user, this is what the application actually can do, and this is how we find it, how we get to it, right? And this open mind is missing, and so what you see is emails introducing new features. Probably many of you have seen these emails, and I don't know how many actually read them. Right. Or should the device at some point just start babbling up and say, hey, here's something new, um, without being intrusive? That's the key, right? How do you actually educate without being intrusive? Uh, if you have a visual UX, you can show visual roll-ups in some of the screen demo devices, for example. Um, again, what's the adoption there? Um, so the easiest one is actually where we had the, the previous case, right? It's a feature and we add a new thing in, in, a new version of it, because then next time you all find the pattern that you saw before, at that point you can bring in the education process. Um, but I think that's overall is still challenging for these things. And really from, from how to develop a user experience. Good. Um, <coughs> I 
promise I'm going back to the education side. Um, right, so it's a different mindset that we need to instill in software developers to really make experimentation part of how they think about building an application. Um, right, it's kind of what question should I, be, as I'm going on, what are actually the questions I need to ask? Um, and <coughs> How do I measure that? That's actually the most important one. How do I measure? Where do I measure? Where do I get my data from? And once I know what I need, how can I actually collect it? Also two different questions, right? In some cases, it goes back to the instrumentation side. In some cases, it means I need to find the data from elsewhere and being able to join it there. Then, of course, I need to learn how to analyze all that. Um, maybe I'm a data scientist on the team, maybe I need to develop my own little statistics skills. If it's a multivariate experiment, I probably should know what an ANOVA is, um, analysis variant, um, things like that. Um, and then the last thing is, ideally, I'm building my system that these feedback loops that I need for the development are built in, into the architecture. Right. So. Ideally, whenever I think about a new system I'm standing up, the feedback loop is part of how the system is engineered from the ground up. Now, so as engineers, um, I also have my exper experience that I made with data scientists on the team. Um, and I had it at Amazon in my last team. I had it in my new team here. Um, it's this. Any idea what this is? No? So, so here's a hint. This is a business problem. What's under the lamp? Software. It's my big fancy public data set on which I had gazillions of methods development in machine learning algorithms. And the challenge that we have is that is not our data. This isn't mattering what we're going to accomplish. Right? And the big challenge is either can I find a way to translate it back, or should I even reformulate my research question from the outset to make sure that's, that's centered to what I'm trying to accomplish. And um, <coughs> I think it's also because, particularly when we, we see students coming in, right? I mean, the best way for students to actually, say, write or create the publication record that they need for academic success means I don't spend time on that, I spend time on the method, mostly, in the, right? And then I use these existing data sets because that also allows me to showcase how my method is so much better than the previous methods. But it means by doing that, understanding what it actually means to build the data and how to validate in a specific context is something that's not really recognized. And so that's something that we see in the industry side of a different kind of skill set that we need to build on. So and this is pretty much my last slide, actually. Um, um, so we are now building a concept card. It's still very early in our team but we have actually data labeling infrastructure going into it from the beginning. We have ground truth evaluation going into it. We think from the very first week about how to evaluate it in the business scenario. And from the beginning, we think about what feedback we'll need. Kind of that when we put this in front of an actual user, we can already collect real behavior, real feedback out of that. Um, so we'll see what comes out of that. We're just building a thing. We'll start our first experiments, hopefully in a few weeks. So with that, um, talked about a few challenges by right? doing actually continuous experimentation in industrial settings. So we talked about the challenges in methodology, particularly for the mid-sized companies, but also some questions on the large enterprise. We have experience of how actually effectively bring that uh, experimentation mindset and required tooling into the process. But then as a planning for the big build ones, 
There's still, I think, a question about prioritization and how do I decide when to apply it as a tool and when does it become too expensive? So what's the right trade-off? Um, on the experience side, we touched really only a little bit the education part uh, when I actually use data-driven discovery of new needs. And I don't have the, the problem, the ability to directly educate the user of what's possible. Um, now it's a new feature. And I think in general, on the education side, um, again, I think this developing of an experimentation mindset is something uh, that also something we are still going through as, as an effort as we adopt these techniques in the industry and bring in new talent uh, to help them understand what's needed to be successful in this form. That's what I had to say. Thank you so much. We definitely have time for a few questions. Hi, Ken Peters, JPL. Um, could you comment a little bit in the continuous experimentation on the role of informed consent of the users? It would depend, obviously, on the application and the scale of change, but if a user runs into a change that makes their business case significantly harder, should there be a way for them to tell that they are in an experiment and opt back to an experience that works better for them? So, so I first misunderstood what you meant by informed consent. Because <laughs> I was more thinking data privacy. So it's kind of more the feature really becomes <coughs> an obstacle in what I want to do. Um, I see where you're going. I think ideally you don't become that destructive in the modification that they can't do what they need to do anymore. Um, and then hopefully you have some form of escalation yes, built in that. I think for example, if you look um, Visual Studio, for example, mm -hmm. in Visual Studio Code, they have directly on the primary frame actually have the feedback thing right at the bottom right. I don't know if they do continuous experimentation in the tool. They could probably, uh, but the way that feedback loop is directly front and center on, in front of you, I think um, that would be something to consider. Um, what, what about the legal implications of this kind of experimentation? Are there like legal issues that the developers have to worry about? Are the attorneys involved in the experimentations they're doing? Like I'm thinking about like the live Amazon website where they decide to I don't know, like for example, I, I'm thinking like Amazon's choice. Like if I'm selling a product on Amazon, I will be devastated if I'm not Amazon's choice because most users are probably going to buy what is Amazon's choice. It, it seems like Amazon is like playing like a market, market maker there. Uh, or things, things along those lines. Are, are, are attorneys involved in these kinds of experimentation? Um, so I can't say too much on, on so Amazon tries something different because that's almost an internal program that's about product selection. That's kind of almost like any retail organization of product selection. Um, but for, I mean, for all the experimentation you do, um, obviously you make sure you work within the framework, the data privacy framework that's in place. Um, it's published many, I don't know how many users actually read what they accept, uh, but you definitely are careful of that. Um, um, that's kind of really gets involved. And then of course, uh, the other question is, if you go beyond, say, exist, yeah, I mean, in general, I mean, you have legal involvement whenever there's concern. So developers it have just, to It's just good practice. practice. Okay. So developers are involved in the attorney in, in the experiments they try to run. Um, as I said, it's kind of, when you, when you, I mean, there's a framework, right, which is a data privacy framework that also describes what experimentation is included. Mm -hmm. You can read. Um, I'm not on Amazon factory, so I'm not going to comment on that. Beyond that, you get a good website with what it is. And if, right, as, as a team you see you need to go beyond what's covered out there, obviously, yes, you come to the US. I'm going to follow up on that. Use my executive privilege here. Because um, we're talking about Amazon, which is selling stuff, right? Yeah. But you're currently working on the intelligent hospital. And so there is going to be some potentially much more serious consequences of experimentation with models and AI. I'm laying on the table and something is happening, right? <laughs> 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 so, so how do you how do you translate this into something like that domain where the consequences might be much more severe? 
Well, I mean, that's kind of where the other consent question actually came. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, fine. <laughs> so that's how it is. So, um, yeah, I think, I mean, you have to be very, very, con I mean, ideally, and yeah, it's the same thing in, in, in the, I mean, I've been working in the economic space for a long time, right? I mean, back in the late 2000s, right, it was all about personal medicine and, and sequence genomics. And, and it, I mean, patient consent and, and having patient data and how to treat personal data, personal medical tools, that was all top of mind at the time. And I think the consideration should just apply in the same form. Um, and of course, in the ideal setting, Back in the day, it still is that the patient gives an explicit consent that they're okay with you using their data in the form you are explaining to them of what you're going to do. So I think if you have the full transparency, that's the, the optimal model. Um, it's a mind, sh it's a change of mind, and it's also not always easy to bring that into the existing healthcare ecosystem. It's just how. It, the current systems are set up, how current process are set up. Um, and in some cases, this has then led, I mean, it, that's a great interesting right? because what you saw in the genomic space at the time was that it meant that data initiatives try to escape the hospital, right? I mean, that's why 23andMe, well, medical, I know they have no little medical edition, but for long time, it's very clear they're not going in the space because outside, could very clearly delineate what's the consent that I'm, as a participant, am giving to the company and the data scientists on that organization to do with my data. Um, and uh, we had similar initiatives, right, just about donating um, general medical data. And um, I think it's still, I think seeing that this conversation hasn't really progressed substantially over the last 10 years, I think it's still still kind of out of it in the open what's really going to come out of that. Yeah, hi, uh, Manu Sridharan, uh, UC Riverside. So voice assistants seem like a particularly you know, open-ended and, and fertile ground for trying to learn from what users are, are failing to do. Do you, do you have any thoughts on uh, whether similar techniques apply in, say, a traditional web or mobile application? Um. It's more challenging. I think one thing you can measure is, um, because you're constrained by what the application can do. Exactly. But uh, I think the part that you can measure out is um, inconveniences, right? Say, if I have to go through a rather complex workflow within, maybe even across multiple applications to get a task established, but if it can actually measure across multiple applications, um, that's something you could probably discover. But I have to go, three steps to manage a task list when I could just build your task list inbox feature. But then particularly, and as that's not what's happening, but in the, in the traditional application, right, it would mean often that the user will jump off the application. For example, I have a concrete example, right? Some kind of data entry functionality and I need to somehow get my data in in bulk or need to organize in a certain form. That's often I see users actually then go to Excel. Right? They would do the work there and then they come back, right? So then you would actually need to watch out. They go to a certain step in the application and then they come out with an import result or something like that, right? And then you, at that point, you should at least get a red flag. Maybe there's something missing, but it's, it's quite difficult to see that. So if they stay within the application, because they see they have to click in circles, maybe that's something I can measure. Or just see, do I see common, common patterns in how data is entered, and that's something I can, can automate. So SAP's classical products don't just stand on their own. There's a whole universe of third-party companies whose whole existence is dependent upon SAP's products and the need to customize those products to a particular, uh, particular customer. So any change that SAP might make to one of its products could have potentially significant downstream effects on that third-party integrator universe. Have you thought about how those third-party companies could be engaged in the experiments and provide their feedback regarding how a change might affect their universe? 
It's a good question. Um, I think a key consideration there, and I mean, it's probably fundamentally not different. So the first part is probably not fundamentally different from um, what traditional product development were. It's important to keep the interfaces stable. So at least as I'm doing my experimentation on the, the on the SAP side, I have a clear interface that protects the partner from being at least function, functionally or fundamentally impacted. Same time, you're right. I mean, as we think about these processes that may jump from an SAP application into a third-party specialized tool and back, um, I think defining an approach is the key yet. Uh, it's something to be thought about. I think on um, what you've been seeing right now being talked a lot at SAP is, uh, say for example, Sapphire was our conference two months ago, um, is actually focusing on the second bullet point that I have on this capability slide, right? Really, as, as first, of, uh, we're right now just at the stage of decomposing uh, our systems into the modular units have a true service architecture around it. And I think once you have that, then indeed the next stage for continuous experimentation would be now layer experimentation on top of that decomposed services where also the difference between the SAP services and the third party services isn't a fundamental distinction anymore, right? Because right now, yes, I have the classic ERP monolith and stuff hanging out on the edges on the side, right? But once our systems are more decomposed, into cloud services, right? Um, then it's really much more about measuring data points across different cloud services. And I would imagine with the right kind of business agreements and with the right business framework, you could find places where you can actually collaborate with the partners and say, okay, in that, say, triangle of services, we want to measure and we want to experiment. But it's, I think at this point, it's, it's further out because we're still lacking some of the core enablement So I was curious what techniques you use to get the engineering teams outside of your innovation center engaged with your innovations, and in particular, how you can get them thinking about collecting the data that you need for experimentations and giving you the hooks that you need. You're thinking now about third party? August? No, actually, I was thinking about or? actually inside SAP. Um, I mean, we have internal education programs. Um, and so a strong driver that we actually see right now at SAP, <coughs> so you may have, I don't know, again, probably haven't followed the news, but um, we made an acquisition of a company called Qualtrics um, end of last year, early this year, um, for example, which is about um, measuring customer experience. And essentially bringing this experience data back into the enterprise where you can combine with the operational data that traditional systems have been using. And so in fact, actually there's a lot of internal education, as well as educa external education going on, just what does it now mean to bring this um, experience data and relate it to what is your operation side. So I think that actually lays a good foundation. Um, and we could then probably piggyback on top of that and say, okay, now this is one thing is I just measure once or I measure reactively once I have that education in place because then and actually we just for example got an invite for a training next week so so there's something happening already but then layering on top of that and say okay now the next level is how do I think about doing this actively would be a natural progression. Yeah you gave an excellent overview on how SAP works with academia. Can you give us some overview as to how you work with startups? How do we work with startups? Um, probably, in, probably in all ways that we cooperation work with startups. Um, so we, we have specific startup accelerator programs even in certain areas that are aligned with certain business initiatives. Um, a few years back, for example, is a good example, right? We launched a new um, data management platform, HANA, by right? Endeavor actually start up accelerate for specific around adopting that. Um, and um, and there's a whole set 
like that. Um, we have internal startup and venture funds. There's also an externally phased venture group. Uh, in some cases, you just look it from a pure business development perspective, right? Is it a acquisition technology of interest? You, you look for acquiring it. So I think it spans the whole spectrum of what you see in terms of uh, business development for corporations. Which part of the design process? The for the experiment? Yes. Um, so for probably depends on what your question is, right? You won't have the right people in the, in the room. I mean, for example, for that specific experiment, we had a web designer in the room who had worked on the actual production user interface, uh, had familiarity with that. Uh, of course, you have domain experts um, behind that part of the shopping experience. Um, so who were the domain experts? Like, what, what were their expertise? What was the expertise of the domain experts? Um, even select, for example, which part of the shopping experience you actually want to restrict the equipment to. Okay. Good. Yeah. So also getting, getting understanding why would you actually, uh, possibly are you most likely to see, collect the relevant data points easily? Um, and then, of course, engineering functions. But I th it was definitely important to have domain expert of the presentation and the domain expert uh, for the business process, domain expert from the data side, the catalog side. So with all those different people in the room, was it difficult to sort of figure out or, or negotiate um, the requirements of the experiment or just get asked to try it? No, it was very straightforward. <laughs> Hi. Um, in other scientific disciplines that uh, rely on experimentation, um, uh, a common set of results are the experiment failed. You know, failed to substantiate the hypothesis or failed to reject the null hypothesis. So if we have it here, we may also come to expect that a lot of the experiments we're going to potentially try uh, could fail for a variety of reasons. So um, one of the things that other disciplines have tried, uh, you know, to try to improve their uh, art of experimentation is they rely on things like uh, theory, domain models, uh, process models, and the like. So uh, could you opine on what you think the role of these things like theory, domain models, or processes are? Because as you said, when you take a look at that in Amazon, uh, shopping alternative, it's kind of hard to imagine what's the domain that we're specifically trying to address or what's the theory or what's the model because it, it's very much uh, insinuated into many other systems that we have. Good question. Um, I, mean, um, I mean, ideally, as I said, I may not be familiar with the domain you're now using as an example. Because I mean, as I, I'm in my my science science background is in the life sciences space, right? Um, and that was really always a question: How do I find theories that are supported by the data? And if the data doesn't support the theory or the model, the model isn't is the one to be thrown out, of, right? Um, so it sounds like the model that has more the, 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 the role of restricting my search space. Um, and it is coming, as I said, since I don't know if the space you come from, I would assume at least like in the life sciences space, I mean, we would, we would use the model to inform the experiments. But I think ultimately also it, it is actually the invalidation of the model you're, look, you, you're looking for, right? Because in, in a way, it's actually more informative, right? Because um, if I only revalidate the model, I'm actually not learning more, really. I'm just repeating the same result. And it's actually the data point that speaks against the, a model is actually the one that, that really, even in the most information theoretic form, is new knowledge that I'm generating. <coughs> That's new information. Um, and um, 
So I'm not sure if, if it's really, I'm using the theory um, to avoid bad outcomes. I almost, w I actually want to see the, I actually want to see that I'm having bad results and they make me rethink my hypothesis because the hypothesis essentially is a draft version of my model or a next version of my model. So at least, I said, at least in the work I've been involved in the past, that was kind of more the approach. But as I said, that doesn't mean it doesn't work differently in other disciplines. So, so no hands quickly shooting up. We're actually running on time. I have a small gift for you. Thank you so much for giving us the talk. Um, I believe you're around, and some of the people from the team are around for more questions that you want to ask them in person. I'm just <laughs> singling you out. Thank you so much.